This is the uh, committee hearing on oversight investigations of the Council of the City of New York for June 19th, 2017. Good morning, everyone. My name is Council Member Vincent Gentili, and I am the chair of the Oversight and Investigations Committee. I'd like to thank my colleagues for joining me here today, Council Member Kaim Deutsch, Council Member Rory Lansman, and Council Member Elizabeth uh, Crowley. We'll have other members of the committee joining us as we uh, proceed. Today, we will hold a hearing on three pieces of legislation that look to improve the efficiency, effectiveness, and transparency of municipal government operations for the betterment of all New Yorkers. Intro 1618, sponsored uh, by yours truly and the council and council members Drum, Lansman, Rosenthal, and Torres, will require that the Department of Investigation conduct annual public outreach campaigns to educate New Yorkers on how to identify different types of government corruption and publicize the mechanisms for submitting complaints to DOI. Additionally, DOA will be required to publish information annually pertaining to resolved complaints received the previous year. Currently, DOI voluntarily conducts advertising campaigns on a periodic basis and most recently developing print and radio advertisements in 2016 with the slogan, bribery and corruption are a trap, don't get caught up in it, report it, and you can see the examples of some of these uh, catchy, and uh, that's not a pun, catchy, um, uh, catchy ads here if you look up at uh, the monitors. Uh, some of the other previous ads, uh, as you can see, say, as, um, had slogans that said, see something crooked in New York City, um, and another one ha had uh, the, uh, the, <coughs> the slogan, get the worms out of the Big Apple. <coughs> so I commend uh, Commissioner the commissioner of the department for committing valuable resources to raising awareness of the important public role of the, the uh, importance that the public plays in assisting DOI in rooting out corruption within our city government. Intro 1618 will expand existing practice and further the public's involvement in reporting wrongdoings to DOI to promote an honest and efficient city government. Additionally, the reporting requirement contained in the bill will add to the DOI, DOI criteria contained in the MMR and provide the council and the public with a more detailed picture of complaints resolved by the department that is currently available in the mayor's management report, including demonstrating impact of public outreach efforts and potentially assisting the identification of trends in government employee misconduct. In intro 1633, also sponsored by me as well as Council Members Rosenthal and Crowley, will require that whenever practicable, the Department of Investigation must complete vendor name checks for prospective city vendors 30 days prior to commencement of a city contract. Vendor name checks, which examine whether a prospective vendor or affiliated individual has been previously subject to a DOI investigation are essential in assisting agency efforts at evaluating prospective vendor responsibility prior to commencing a contract. As Commissioner Peters testified at this committee's preliminary budget hearing last March, uh, currently DOI completes approximately 94% of vendor name checks within the 30-day window prescribed by the rules of the City of New York. This legislation codifies that practice. Under current laws and, regulation and edges, uh, regulations, an agency is able to enter into a contract with a vendor even uh, if DOI hasn't completed the background check within that period. The local law will codify within the city charter the time frame for the completion of the vendor name checks to ensure that future administrations continue this vital practice of guaranteeing the responsibility and trustworthiness of vendors vying for city contracts. And finally, Intro 1591, sponsored by Council Members Crowley and Barron, will establish an Inspector General within DOI dedicated solely to overseeing the operation of the Human Resource Administration and the Department of Homeless Services. Currently, the IG to HRA and DHS is also signed to another agency. 
I believe that Councilmember Crowley will speak further regarding her legislation. And for the record, the Department of Investigation has been invited to testify today, but I am informed, unfortunately, that the commissioner is unable to attend. Um, but he does have several members of his staff in the audience. Um, however, the Department of Investigation has indicated to me that they will send a letter to the council by the end of this week, which will be used as testimony as part of this record for today's Oversight Investigations Committee hearing. I want to thank our committee counsel, Josh Kingsley, my legislative director, Jonathan Chapshehis, my legislative assistant, uh, Taylor Mills, for preparing this hearing today. And I'd like to thank all the stakeholders, advocates, and members of the public who have joined us here today, and I look forward to your testimonies. And now I will uh, ask Councilmember Crowley um, to have some opening remarks on her legislation. Thank you, Chair Gentile. Uh, thank you for conducting today's hearing and including intro 1591, which I sponsored on the agenda. Time and time again, New York City is faced with another crisis within our homeless shelter system, ranging from health violations to life-threatening, dangerous building violations. The Department of Homeless Services' most recent scorecard shows roughly 16,000 open violations in city shelters. The city contracts with nonprofits for these shelters and pays them top dollar, yet the locations are crawling with thousands of violations that have not been addressed. Intro 1591 will create an office for an inspector general to oversee exclusively the Department of Homeless Services and the Human Resources Administration. Inspector General's office, with appropriate staffing dedicated solely to these two agencies, will be charged with investigating and reviewing the departmental policies and procedures to identify any waste, fraud, corruption, or abuse. It would also monitor how well the city responds to shelter inspections and violations. An inspector general can also provide recommendations to improve the Department of Homeless Services operations, which expense budget totals $1.6 billion and supports a headcount of 2,484 employees. Human Resources Administration's expense budget totals $9.85 billion and supports a headcount of 14,000 696 employees. The combined budgets for these agencies account for more than 13% of the city's total budget, which is just under $85 billion. A dedicated IG is warranted for this agency's budget and for this agency uh, and the magnitude of their budget within our overall city budget. I was looking forward to a productive discussion today on hearing this testimony and hearing from the Department of Investigation, and I am very disappointed that they are not here to address this bill. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you, uh, Councilmember uh, Crowley. And we'll, uh, we'll begin then with our first, uh, our first uh, testimony from uh, uh, Brandon Muir from the uh, group Reclaim New York. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I just want to understand, DOI, they're not here because some emergency happened that prevented the commissioner from coming? I mean, that happens, I understand. I just, I just don't, I want to understand why DOI isn't testifying. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't know the, the, the particulars. Uh, he did indicate to me that um, he does have, um, he will submit something to me by the end of the week, um, but that uh, he was unfortunately unable to be here um, today. And uh, the circumstances under which that's the case, um, I'm not clear about, uh, but he could not be here today. But he did assure me um, that uh, he would uh, submit that testimony with some suggestions to uh, um, um, the bills. I, I believe he mentioned 16, 18, 16, 33. I'm not sure uh, the position he's taking on 1591. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Muir, you can begin. Well, good morning to Chairman Gentile and the members of the Oversight and Investigations Committee. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Brandon Muir, and I'm the Executive Director of Reclaim New York, a nonprofit, nonpartisan 501c3 organization 
that seeks to educate and engage New Yorkers on issues like affordability and transparency. Reclaim is dedicated to promoting increased transparency and accessibility in local government across the state. We have used the Freedom of Information Law and a rubric of transparency guidelines to work with municipalities across the state to help them become more transparent and accessible online. This not only serves to give citizens increased access to their local government, but helps government to streamline processes, gather business intelligence, and become better stewards of their resources. I'm here today to comment on two proposals, Intro 1633 and Intro 1618. Intro 1633 requires the Department of Investigations to complete vendor name checks for city vendors 30 days prior to the commencement of a contract. It is our understanding that this measure ensures that no vendor contracts could commence without a verification being completed. That requirement would increase public confidence in the contracting process. While citizens would be glad to know that existing data shows nearly all vendors are being vetted, gaps do exist. Closing that gap and requiring 100% vetting to ensure that the city does not do business with vendors who have a checkered pass is a step in the right direction. Bill 1618 requires the Department of Investigation to conduct public outreach efforts to educate the public about identifying and submitting complaints regarding government corruption, fraud, and waste. As Reclaim is an organization that empowers citizens to play a more active role in government oversight, driven by very similar campaigns to raise awareness, we strongly support the intention of this bill. As a strong defender of the taxpayer in New York, it will be important for the campaigns to identify and make public specific metrics that judge the efficacy of the ad campaigns. Government engagement by citizens, especially regarding corruption, is not easy to facilitate, and the ad campaigns would be just one of the many variables supporting this effort. Quantifiable reporting metrics delivered quarterly to the City Council will assist in ensuring the offering is on target and continually improved. The bill would also require the Department to submit an annual report of complaints filed. As Reclaim enters the third year of our statewide transparency project, I'd like to share two key lessons we've learned on the reporting habits of local government officials. Consistent citizen oversight relies on citizens understanding that the rules of the game exist. Requiring each agency under this bill's purview to maintain a clear reporting process for ethics violations on its website would facilitate stronger civic engagement. The barrier to completion must be left as low as possible. Citizen oversight is habit forming, but habits rely on consistency. A once a year posting schedule would prohibit timely review for citizens, data specialists, and journalists who raise the challenging questions that lead to better governance. The disaggregated presentation of data mentioned in the intro is exactly what this bill needs. It is an important component, but we would also include machine readability in the data composure. Ideally, as a complaint is filed, it should be registered and viewable in a privacy-protected context on the Department of Investigation's website. Upon complaint resolution, the information should be made available as quickly as possible, with 30 to 60 days being an ideal upper limit. The annual report should serve as the agency's opportunity to highlight quarterly improvements and for the public to assess the trajectory of the agency's responsiveness. On behalf of Reclaim New York, I support the City Council's consideration of the two intros discussed today because they would both increase transparency in city government and help facilitate citizen-driven oversight. Our recommendations are offered to strengthen the bills on behalf of transparency, but we strongly believe it's off to a great start. Thank you for the opportunity to comment, and I would be happy to answer any questions the council has. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muir, and thank you for your uh, testimony. And I'll start off with um, some questions, and then uh, if my colleagues have other questions, we'll, we'll um, continue. Let's start off with um, intro uh, 618, uh, which is the public outreach um, uh, bill. Um, how would you rate the Department of Investigation's job today in reaching out to the public? Well, the impetus of my comment that we want to quantify how that's working is really to guide the spending from the start. So you mentioned the ads on the radio, the ads on the subway. Uh, to be honest, I don't remember personally seeing those, but we see, I think, on average 5,000 ads a day. So 
it's a tight market space, and there's a lot of You don't remember seeing any of those, right? I don't, no, and I, and I think they're very clever. It took me a, good, a minute to get the Central Park <laughs> analogy in there, but, um, uh, but, but to my point is we engage in awareness-raising campaigns every day, specifically on corruption and transparency, and I know how crowded that field is to compete for eyeballs and to compete for a memory that ultimately connects what you learned in that subway ad back to a, a civic action. So the recommendation uh, to me would be, if we're going to be spending additional taxpayer dollars uh, on outreach like this, quantify what we're trying to aim uh, to achieve. So is it increased complaints? Is it increased complaints in a specific area because that area is deemed more sensitive or more harmful in nature if they're not caught? Um, you know, I, I think the ability uh, to understand what the objective is of the spend, not just a general awareness raising campaign, would be really important. Um, to the core of your question, though, I, you know, I've, I've been on the website. I've never personally filed a, a complaint with DOI, but I don't think they can make it much easier to file a complaint than what they already have on their website, right? So it's right there in the front. They did a great job of report corruption. It's one form, uh, very easy to complete. So to the to the procedural aspect of it, I think they're doing a great job. So. But obviously these ads uh, are to inform the public about a particular service or function that DOI provides. Um, do you feel that an outreach and ad campaign um, can effectively inform the public of DOI's role in combating corruption? Of course, and I would look to see something say something. I mean, that's now... Uh you know, something I think I've heard on Saturday Night Live, right? It's become such a popular moniker. So I think what we're debating here today is the spend required to do that. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that, you know, you're talking about millions of dollars to push a message, I think it's just really important that we put um, metrics around that to determine what is success and what isn't. Uh, you know, the Startup New York is the state-level program that's come under a lot of fire, $55 million spent. And, you know, I think to the detriment uh, was that wasn't identified on the front end, what does success look like, right? Is it saying that 15 million eyeballs over the next 12 months need to see something? Is it an increase of 15% in complaints? I think it's really important that, that you have that tool as the, as the council member to conduct that oversight on the people who would be spending that money. So, uh, and I'll get to your um, suggestion about repo uh, reporting periods in a, in a second. Let me just ask, the, the, the bill itself requires the outreach um, to include the use of print, radio, and public forums. Um, do you believe that there are other platforms which DOI could or should use to conduct their outreach? Well, there's certainly other platforms. I mean, we do... Uh a variety of our outreach on Twitter, Facebook, right, the basic social media platforms. Um, you know, I, I think I would want to know when I'm in the state of mind to file a complaint, where am I looking for information? And to me, the first place I would look would be online, right, essentially a Google search around keywords like New York City government, corruption, or ethics violation. So if I were targeting an ad campaign, I would certainly want to own those words and ensure that we're getting, getting coverage in those areas. But for general brand raising, right, so we're not really in a, a direct call to action because I'm on the subway and I'm seeing this ad. It doesn't mean I have some sort of ethics violation in my head right now that I'm ready to report. Um, but th these are going to speak to the mass commuters and certainly going to see a lot of eyeballs there as well. So uh, the, the, the bill... Uh you mentioned the disaggregation, um, uh, and, it, and the bill requires the complaints to um, be disaggregated by agency, month, type of misconduct, and the mecha mechanism through which the complaint was sufficient. Do you, do you believe that that is uh, enough data to report on, that type of disaggregation? Well, you could never have enough data. but. I think it's a good start, and, and I, I say that because so much of what makes transparency work, and I use the word habit for me because I truly believe it is, what makes it work, though, is having a starting point, right? So your journalists and your citizen activists have a place to say, great, you gave me columns A, B, and C, but you know what would have been great if I could 
if I could have seen this over here, right? So I think we need to look at it in the context of an ongoing effort to increase transparency, not just a one-time statement or a one-time bill. Um, I do think it's a good place to start, but I think what makes transparency work is when we look at it more of a commodity, right? There's a supply and demand for it. You're essentially mandating supply at this point, but we have to rely on the journalists and the citizen activists to come in and demand what they want, right? So I don't think we can pick with perfect precision what exactly needs to be added. I, I think the point is you're getting it over the starting line, and the beauty of crowdsourcing transparency and involving citizens and involving journalists is you know, they're not going to hesitate to speak up and tell you what they need. So in as much as this is a starting point, you're in support of that? Right? Yes. Okay. Um, now, you did mention um, the reporting should be a, a, a quarterly, and the, the bill is written as an annual reporting. Just talk a little bit about that um, as, as why you think a quarterly is more effective um, a tool for, uh, f for the public and, and for, for us in government. Sure. Uh, so I'll give you an example. When we started on Long Island, we submitted a freedom of, effort, uh, freedom of information request to every village, town, school district and county on Long Island, and our request was for their annual checkbook. So we did this in 2016 and 2015 for the 2014 checkbook, and the problem with data after a year or two years is that it's not considered timely and it becomes more difficult uh, to, to have the um, understanding of the context with which the money was spent or with the action happened. So. On the outside looking in, it's important that we get timely data in the hands of people who know how to do something with it. Uh, on the reverse side, you want to instill a habit of timely reporting within each of your agencies. So instead of an annual report where you know, 30 days out or 45 days out, we start planning how we're going to get all this data together, that tends to preclude it from getting built into the business process of daily work. Whereas if we're looking at reporting to be delivered as soon as the claim is filed, and again, in a privacy-protected way, but that person uh, gets their, their code number, and to the extent that this already exists because I haven't filed a complaint, you know, gr that's great. Um, but you'd want to look at it through the steps of the process, right, from submission to review to, you know, whatever these processes are, uh, or, or phases, rather, in the consideration of the complaint. But then as soon as it's done, you really don't even want to wait for a quarter. You want that case file to be closed and, and allow for reporting online. And, and so instead of the quarter or the annual report being the big check-in moment, that's really more the aggregation moment when we say, okay, let's look at all of Q1 complaints in, in an aggregate and look at what lessons learned are there from Q4 last year and Q3 previously. Instead of that being sort of the surprise moment when journalists – and citizen activists actually get their hands on data and can do something with it. So beyond um, the quarterly aggregate, you're advocating that there be immediate posting of, uh, of a complaint um, uh, keeping within the confidentiality rules. Correct. Is that, am I correct, correct. Uh, about that? And, and that posting then would, would uh, would track the progress of that of that complaint? Is that, uh, I'm trying to get your mm -hmm. vision of what this should look like. So I'm trying to think of a, a, a process that you can go online and um, I think Domino's actually right now, when you order Domino's pizza, right? Order submitted, you, you know, you, mm -hmm. pepperoni being added to your pie, right? And uh, order is out for delivery and then order is delivered. So not to compare the Department of Investigation to Domino's, Domino's Pizza. But, <laughs> but the idea is the private sector has processes that we've come to know, right? Your Uber is arriving. So that is a really good example of uh, effective um, constituent services. I mean, that's, that's informing your audience of what's going on at each step, and it adds confidence in the process. So if my review has been stuck in – or my complaint has been stuck in review for three months, right? At least I know it's been received and it's being processed and it's in review. And it allows you to say uh, to your constituent, well, that is, that is an outlier, right? That is three standard deviations away from normal. We have to go call Department of Investigations immediately to find out what's going on. Without that clarity, though, in the phases, 
you're really you know, not, not able to do that level of, uh, of review. Yeah, and, and this is one reason why it's unfortunate DOI is not here because uh, we could ask them about their, their uh, capability to do such a um, um, posting and, 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 and um, checking uh, through the, uh, the, the process with the um, quarterly uh, aggregate, uh, disaggregation of, of all the results. Let's turn to um, 1633, uh, um, which uh, requires, would require the DOI to conduct vendor <coughs> name checks uh, 30 days prior to commencement of a contract with, this, uh, with the city. Um, in general, I uh, just want to ask your opinion. Uh, should a city agency be able to contract with um, a vendor if that vendor, for whatever reason, uh, didn't have a completed background check? The only way I can see fit for that to happen is if we're in some strange exception of the rule, and I'm not aware of any of those where, um, uh, you know, if we're in an emergency situation and the, the exceptions are necessary, that's one thing. But in the general standard daily business transactions of contracting with the city, um, I think it's wise and necessary for 100% of vendors to go through the vetting process. As it, as it stands now, despite the rules of the City of New York, um, there can be, under those circumstances um, today, an unimproved, uh, unapproved vendor um, who might, and I say might, have a history of malpractice uh, uh, officially doing business with the city, and that's really what we're focusing on. Now, to DOI's credit, they did testify, the commission did testify that 94% um, of those checks are made within the 30-day uh, period. Um, I'm not sure if, if you have any thoughts or ideas about other systematic checks that can be added or what steps can be taken to pre prevent, other than what we're doing today, to prevent the other 6% of vendors from entering contract with the city? Well, again, I think it's important to highlight the 94%. If our trains ran on time 94% of the time, we'd, we'd all be great. We'd be right. happy with we'd that. We'd be very happy. So, uh, you know, I think they deserve a pat on the back for a process that's largely working as designed. Um, you know, to the extent that we're going to chase the final 6%, and I think we should, I would want to know. Uh, if there are examples over the past couple of years where those 6% had an inordinate cost to the city, so, you know, the 6% that gets through, is it just a matter of additional days needed, or did something really go wrong with those contracts where we identify that this is an area where y you need to mandate 100%, uh, or 94% is good enough, and there weren't any big examples of problems. So. You know, I'd have to get deeper into the contracting procedures and, and the vetting process uh, to, to understand fully what they are looking to uh, review and, and what not, because there's obviously very different levels of vetting. Um, but again, I think you want to aim for 100%, and, and to the point that you approach that 100%, and there's cost implications of doing a much deeper dive, I would just want to compare that to what the real cost is that, that happens when we let these 6% get through. Uh, and, and I think that would probably be the argument uh, of DOI had they been here about the, the resources and the cost factor um, to add uh, to that, uh, that vendor review um, unit that, that, that they have. Uh, that's, that 6% that, uh, that is the goal to, to address that 6%, and by codifying it, um, even though the DOI has done a commendable job with the 94%, um, codifying it here in this legislation uh, is is not only for this uh, uh, go-round of a DOI, but future uh, administrations uh, to have that 100% uh, uh, vendor check uh, I in place. Um, so, um, so, you know, I, I would just add one other piece. I'd want to know why those 6% didn't make it through, right? Are we talking about substantively different contracts that these companies are much harder to vet? Or was it simply we get 1,000 a week and we got 96% of that done and those were just the last ones that we didn't get in? So to the extent that it's not just a time question around resources, to the extent that it's a substantively different type of vetting that, that goes on, I would certainly want to ask questions about that because it, it begs the question why are those 
either being left to last or why are they so much harder and therefore is there something else at stake in these contracts? Are they larger contracts? Are they bigger companies that, that I'd want to know? Um, just for the record, uh, the testimony that the uh, commissioner gave last time about this issue was a resource issue, the, uh, having the volume versus the resources to handle the volume of, of contracts that come in, if, if my memory serves me correctly on, on that, yes. Um, do you have any questions? No. Okay, great. All right, so uh, Ms. Muir, thank you for coming in. I appreciate your testimony and, uh, and your suggestions are well taken. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, our next, uh, uh, our next testimony will be from uh, Mr. Tawaki Komatsu, I believe. Am I correct in that? Okay, thank you. Mr. Komatsu, just state your name for the record and tell us, uh, are you, are you uh, representing any particular group? Um, I'm not representing any group. Um, my name is Tawaki Komatsu, as you just stated. Um, I'm here to testify in support of Ms. Crowley's bill, as well as in support of uh, th the discussion um, that w well, what was just discussed about vendor responsibility, um, meaning New York City should only uh, receive services from vendors that are abiding by all applicable laws. Um, one of the reasons why I'm here today is because I have I actually have litigation against HRA because they've been in defiance of a New York State Administrative Law Judge's decision since September uh, 15th of 2016. I've reached out to numerous groups to try to get assistance with that. However, all those groups have been entirely unresponsive. Um, one of the reasons why Ms. Crowley proposed the bill was to have oversight of HRA. So if the commissioner of HRA was in this room on April 20th giving, giving misleading statements to one of the people sitting in your chairs about how when someone gets evicted from their apartment, there's no reason for them to go from the Bronx, go from, the, from, go from Queens to the Bronx. Actually, that happened to me. So if Mr. Banks was sitting in this chair on April 20th, I don't know if, if he was under oath at the time when he made that statement, but that's a material misstatement of fact. Um, also, on July 2nd of last year, I was uh, assaulted after an, an earlier attempted assault on May 12th, um, and that was only possible because uh, one of HRA's partners, Urban Pathways, subjected me to a bait and switch with regards to the apartment lease agreement I signed at HRA on f February 16th of last year. So the question is, if HRA's own records confirm that I reported that bait and switch to HRA on March 16th of last year, then why didn't it take action? Why didn't it take corrective action that would have forestalled that attempted assault on May 12th and then uh, certainly prevented that actual assault on July 2nd that led to me being diagnosed with a concussion on July 30th? Um, Did you have any contact with um, anyone at uh, the IG's office, the Inspector General's office for HRA? They actually left me a voicemail message, I think, in February of last, no, February of this year, telling me that for whatever problems I have with HRA, I have to deal directly with HRA instead of somebody else, um, which is per very perplexing. So let me just give a, I don't want to uh, dominate your time, waste your time, so let me just provide a quick rundown of um, false and misleading remarks Stephen Banks has made um, in the past. I was at a meeting at the New York Law School on December 16th of last year in a room f of maybe 100 people, including attorneys and legal services providers. That event was recorded on video, so in case there's any uncertainty about what was, what was said and the context in which it was said, you can just watch the video for yourself and make your own independent decisions. So there, Mr. Banks made a statement to the effect of things we can control, we are very focused on controlling in regards to the homeless problem. So if, again, if I reported to HRA on uh, March 16th that I was subjected to a bait and switch and HRA gave Urban Pathways 1.8 million, more than $1.8 million of taxpayer money to provide veterans like myself with services and housing and Urban hasn't been doing that Instead, it had a 
uh, fundraiser at the Grand Hyatt. While it, if you take a look at the ACRIS website, you can see what kind of mortgage it has for that building. So on one hand, it's getting funding through that mor mortgage agreement. On another, it's getting funding from taxpayers. Um, HPD issued violations about conditions in that building. They haven't been taken care of, and they, those violations were issued long ago. Um, another uh, false statement that Mr. Banks made at that December 16th meeting was that the mayor owns the problem, I own the problem in regards to homelessness. Again, um, Stephen Banks' wife is actually the supervising judge citywide for the housing courts. So if I was subject to an unlawful eviction by Queens housing judge Clifton Denmark, who's still on the bench, who came to my apartment on July 10th of 2015, told me to shut off this audio recording device I was recording him with to determine to basically use on appeal in the event he conducted a fraudulent inspection in my apartment. There's actually a California federal court decision from 2014 that basically says if a governmental officer comes into your residence, you have a due process right to record those officers in your own residence as long as you don't interfere with their ability to perform their official duties. Scratcher, I, I, I know you have a list of but complaints. I'll keep it short. Yeah, so no, I just want to try to keep it cl uh, as close as possible to what right. we're discussing so here bottom, today. Bottom line is there really isn't any oversight of HRA. Like I said, I beat HRA on appeal. Um, the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance has not enforced its own decision. Instead, it scheduled a redundant, pointless fair hearing in which it basically reneged on its original decision without cause. That's why I have this litigation at the New York Supreme Court. Um, e even before I came into this room, even before I had any interaction with HRA, Urban Justice did, an own, did their own independent audit of HRA's practices. According to their audit, it confirmed that HRA violates their procedures routinely. And so did the uh, New York City Comptroller long ago, I think in 2009. It talked about fair hearings, how you know, there have been redundant, pointless fair hearings. Um, I think Mr. Banks made a remark on April 20th about that in this room, that HRA was subject to like a $10 million penalty for redundant fair hearings. <laughs> How do you think uh, Councilmember Crowley's bill uh, would make the situation better from your perspective by having an a inspector general devoted to HRA in the sure. So let me answer that question directly. Um, based on my experience with HRA, um, of course I'm biased, but I really don't see any better candidate than me to be the inspector general of HRA given the fact that I've had to resort to litigation against it and sustain a concussion because it failed to act. I should also point out that I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. There was news recently about seven sailors getting killed on a ship. I was assigned to that same uh, naval base in Japan where I served with a top secret security clearance. So if you have any question about, I guess, my integrity, take a look at my DD-214. And did you also have uh, some testimony on 1633? Yeah, um, so with regards to the discussion that was about using responsible vendors, um, the, the underlying root cause that got me into the position where I am today um, is the fact that a company called NTT Data, it's an IT outsourcing company, it's a huge government contractor. It stole my pay five years ago while I was working at Credit Suisse when Credit Suisse illegally coerced me to work 50 hours per week and I only got paid 40 hours. When I complained about that, I was immediately retaliated. I'm involved in litigation against both Credit Suisse and NTT Data as we speak and as I sit in this chair. I have a brief that I have to submit to the Second Circuit um, by City Hall by Friday this week. And with regards to HRA's Office of Civil Justice, if you actually take a look th at the bill that caused that uh, division to be uh, like established, it's actually required to provide people like me, to, the, the terminology is to ensure that people like me get the legal assistance that they need, either assistance or representation, and that hasn't happened. In fact, Stephen Banks falsely told me to my face on April 11th in Staten Island that one of his legal services providers declined to provide me with assistance because there was no merit. The problem with that remark is that I actually got a letter from that same organization telling me it wasn't because of merit, it was because of inadequate resources to provide me with assistance. So there's a clear discrepancy, be discrepancy between lack of merit and lack of resources. And, and how do you feel that vendor check uh, would uh, address an issue like that? Sure, um, well, you could essentially, with, with regards to the vendor check, um, HRA, there's ample cause for HRA to immediately terminate its contract with that company. I mean, think about it. If I'm getting benefits from tax, essentially from taxpayers, only because of the fact this company HRA is doing business with stole my pay, HRA has a clear mandate to immediately terminate its business or at least 
steer its funding from going to that company to, to my wallet for the services I provided five years ago. I mean, this is a company that also does business with the Department of Education, the Attorney General's office. So if I try reaching out to Eric Schneiderman's office, there's a clear confl conflict of interest in trying to get some legal remedy on the grounds that his own office is doing business with that same entity. Great. Okay. I appreciate your testimony. I think we have uh, some. Uh, I think uh, Councilmember Crowley has a question or two. Thank you, Chair. Sir, how long have you been um, affiliated or worked with uh, HRA? Um, since October 22nd of 2015. So for the past two years? Approximately, yeah. And so they were uh, helping you with housing? Um, to, I would say not really, only because of the fact when I was subjected to that bait and switch and I was assaulted in the- I don't know what it means when you say bait and switch. If you're shopping for a car, if you're shopping for a two-door car and the dealer gives you a four-door car, you ask for red, they give you white. Yeah. It's apples and oranges. Right. So that's essentially what a bait and switch is. You ask for one type of product or service and- Yeah, but, but you- you're mentioning that while you're referring to your residence. Correct. And so what happened there? Um, I signed, a, like I said, I signed a lease agreement for a particular apartment for a private apartment that was fully furnished. I have a copy of the lease in over there. Well, the two leases. I have one, a lease for the, the actual lease I signed on, on February 16th, then the second illegal lease in which Urban Pathways forged my signature and materially changed the terms. So this lease was with an agency that works with HRA? Correct. And it was housing for veterans? Correct. Okay. So uh, where are you living now? In that same building, in that same apartment, without a valid lease. And I brought that to HRA's attention. They haven't done anything about it. So you've done a lot of research before you, you came today. And so you referenced the urban justices study as well as the controller's study and uh, both are backdated or not even vast. I mean, it's good that they both did their investigations. I mean, 2009 is a long time ago. But the facts still apply. No, I'm, look, I agree that w it's my bill. I support that we need the oversight. I just, I even think that we don't even know how much uh, waste uh, abuse happens within these two city agencies because there just isn't enough oversight. And on top of that, um, there was recently litigation uh, in Brooklyn about uh, uh, opposing the opening of new shelters because the community wor wasn't properly um, engaged. Uh, their right to be heard wasn't provided. <coughs> so I was actually sitting in the back of that courtroom during the proceedings of that case trying to advocate on behalf of the community b based on my familiarity with HRA's actual practices of right. um, not taking appropriate action. How long do you, have you lived in New York? Um, s pretty much all my life. And uh, it's only been since this incident two years ago that you've been tracking this agency? You've been uh, listening more to uh, Mr. Banks? Um, well, what, in, what originally brought me in contact with Mr. Banks was um, on March 1st of last year, he was at the Yale Club giving a speech where the new chief judge of New York State was present. At, um, and it basically, uh, I had been in the Bellevue shelter in February of, that, of last year. My iPhone was stolen in that shelter because there were no door locks on the doors. And that's after I was temporarily put in the hotel system. So if New York City controller did an audit of security in the shelters and it confirmed that there wasn't security in the Bellevue shelter, um, then it was entirely foreseeable that the lack of locks on the door lock on the doors would lead to theft, would lead to assaults, what have you. And I brought that to Mr. Banks' attention on March 1st at the Yale Club. His response to me was that the NYPD was conducting a security audit of the sec conditions in the shelters um, instead, of ha instead of taking appropriate action. Less than, I think, two months later, someone was actually murdered in that same shelter. Hmm. Um, it, was, it made the news. They, they had their throat slit. So the question is, if I spoke face-to-face -face with Stephen Banks on March 1st, about the lack of security in that particular shelter, and then someone had their throat slit less than two months later, who's liable? He's, the, I mean, it's a HRA shelter, clearly. At that point in time, HRA was responsible for the operations and security in that particular shelter. So can they really pass the buck? I mean, 
I actually I filed a claim with the controller's office to have HRA reimburse me for the cost of that stolen iPhone as well as the increased service charges because the unlimited data plan I was subscribed to no longer was available. The control uh, the controller basically said no. Uh, HRA also said no when I asked them to reimburse me for that. They essentially said we're not responsible for stolen property regardless of the fact that we weren't uh, complying with applicable New York State law in terms of securing the shelters. So back to right. your bill. Mm -hmm. your, your, bu your bill is about oversight. Yeah. So if you have this agency running loose with no oversight, People get harmed. People get right. killed. People have their property stolen. People go without legal assistance and have to go three years at the Queen Supreme Court beating a slumlord in Regal Park in a $20 million defamation case without the benefit of counsel and after five judges in that case. I can give you, give you the legal decision where on March, I think, 17th, the, final, the fifth and final judge issued a decision in my favor dismissing that case. So the question is, before that fifth and final judge did so, Exactly what were the four previous judges assigned to that case doing in allowing that case to remain on the docket? But did that case have to do with HRA or DHS? Um, indirectly, only because of the fact that Mr. Banks, again, he's married to the supervising judge. <laughs> and what prompted, what prompted the litigation against that slumlord yeah. was I previously beat that slumlord on my own in housing court mm -hmm. in two, October of 2013. Um, I have a sworn affidavit from that slumlord uh, saying that they knew about a defective elevator in the building for over a year and a half, didn't do a darn thing about it, and they're now trying to kick out a 66-year-old woman from her $850 apartment. Does that slumlord do work with HRA? Um, I can't tell you because I think HRA keep its, keeps its records pretty confidential. But I appreciate you sharing that information with me about your conversation with uh, Mr. Banks and um, what happened at the Bellevue uh, shelter. So... Um, you know, if there's more information you'd like to send my office, um, sure. I'd be more than happy to gather and collect all that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matsu, Th and good luck to you also. <clears throat> um, let me just put in a few things on the record, and we, we'll, hold the, um, we'll hold it open for a couple of minutes. Um, um, we were also joined here earlier uh, by two other committee members, uh, Councilman Danny Drum, and council member Helen Rosenthal, um, and they were here earlier um, during the uh, testimony. Um, I also want to put on the record that we have a um, we have a statement of support from Citizens Union who could not be here to testify today, but they have asked us to put on the record that uh, they are in support of sixteen. Um, 33 and 1618, uh, the two um, the two bills relating to public outreach, and um, and uh, the uh, vendor check bill, um, and they indicate that they will be submitting written testimony within the next day to this committee uh, concerning um, intro 1618 and 1633. So I want to say for the record that Citizens Union. Is on uh, uh, is supportive and will be uh, submitting to this committee uh, written um, testimony. Again, I also want to reiterate the um, the fact that the um, um, the commissioner of uh, DOI has indicated to us to me that uh, his office uh, will be submitting uh, testimony um, to this committee uh, concerning uh, this hearing. And uh, the testimony will be included as part of the record, uh, the uh, testimony of the record uh, in this committee. Um, and certainly, uh, again, um, I, I know the disappointment in, in the members here and, and uh, um, may so the public that uh, the commission could not attend today. Um, but um, we are, uh, I will share with the committee uh, his testimony when we receive it. Um, by the end of the week, I'm told, by Friday. I will share it with the members of the committee and uh, Council Member Crowley also will, will, um, will get that. Um, so I'll, I'll stay here for a couple of minutes because I think there's a member that's uh, on his way over. Um, so rather than close the hearing at the moment, um, I will just uh, I will sit here for another five minutes. Uh, but uh, officially, um, as far as, there's, as I can see, there's no other testimony. Am I correct? No other testimony. 
in the hearing. So we'll just we'll just uh, recess for a couple of minutes. Everyone here is welcome to to leave to stay. We're just going to recess for five minutes. Thank you.
We've been uh, joined at the committee hearing today by uh, Council Member Constantinides from Queens. Thank you for joining us. Um, you missed the testimony, but that's fine. <laughs> we'll fill you in. And there will be testimony coming from the Department of Investigation in a letter to the committee, which I will share with each committee member uh, by this Friday. Okay, great. With that, the committee, uh, <clears throat> committee hearing is closed. Thank you all for coming and testifying. Thank you. This committee is closed.